Point of care ultrasound gives us the ability to perform bedside echocardiography in the emergency department. And this, in turn, gives us some pretty valuable information into our patient's hemodynamic status. Specifically, the ultrasound machine has the ability to allow us to quickly and easily estimate a left ventricular ejection fraction. But in order to understand the significance of ejection fraction, we have to go back to some of the basics of hemodynamics. So in hemodynamics, the name of the game, the key endpoint is organ perfusion. And this is driven by mean arterial pressure. In fact, this is the reason why we measure non-invasive blood pressure. Remember that two-thirds the diastolic plus one-third the systolic, otherwise stated as two times the diastolic plus the systolic divided by three is equal to mean arterial pressure. And mean arterial pressure has two main components, and these are cardiac output and systemic vascular resistance. Now, the systemic vascular resistance we can't really measure, uh, but we can measure cardiac output, because the components of this are heart rate times stroke volume. Stroke volume is defined as the volume of blood ejected from the left ventricle during systole. And this is equal to the volume by which the left ventricle has diminished in size i.e. the end systolic volume subtracted from the end diastolic volume. If we divide this by the initial left ventricular volume, i.e. the end diastolic volume, this gives us the percentage of volume by which the left ventricle has contracted, and we call this the ejection fraction. In this way, stroke volume is proportionate to ejection fraction and serves as a proxy for stroke volume measurement. Now what we do have to keep in mind is that we're using ultrasound, which is a two-dimensional imaging modality, to estimate a three-dimensional measurement. It's inevitably going to lead to some drawbacks. Uh, number one, since we're using the observations of wall motion to estimate ejection fraction, then accuracy will be affected by any regional wall motion abnormalities. And number two, because the measurements we're taking are based on the operator's observations, then some degree of inaccuracy can be expected. Now we can improve this with repetition and practice and improving our skill set. Um, and another thing that arises is that there's going to be some degree of inter-operator variability in the measurements as well. By visually inspecting the heart in echocardiography, we can roughly estimate whether or not the ejection fraction is normal, this being greater than 60 to 65%. This method does take some practice to become comfortable with, and the accuracy will improve with repetition uh, and as we become more proficient in obtaining the views. And we should use three views for this method, and these are the parasternal long axis, the parasternal short axis, and the apical four-chamber view. And going over these in detail is beyond the scope of this presentation, uh, but the Sonosim site is a great resource for learning how to perform these. So let's take a look at the normal heart in a parasternal long axis view. And remember we use the phase array probe in cardiac mode, uh, placing the probe at the left sternal border and in the third to fifth intercostal space and orienting the probe along the long axis of the heart, which runs between the right shoulder and the left hip. Uh, place the probe indicator opposite the screen marker and you'll get the following view of the heart showing the right ventricle, the left atrium, the mitral valve, the left ventricle, the left ventricular outflow tract, and the aortic valve. Now what we're looking for here to estimate the ejection fraction are a few different uh, characteristics. The number one is the movement of the mitral valve leaflets. More so the one we're concerned with is the anterior leaflet here. And this is, uh, the tip of the anterior leaflet is actually called the E-point. With a normal ejection fraction, the mitral valve leaflets should actually have quite a bit of movement to them, and the anterior leaflet should come in pretty close contact with the interventricular septum, as it does here. Uh, in fact, the distance between the E-point and the septum is sometimes called the EPSS, or the E-point septum separation. Uh, the second characteristic we're looking at is the thickening of the myocardium itself, and you can see here that uh, that myocardium is uh, thickening to a normal degree. And the third characteristic is reduction of the left ventricular cavity, which is also called fractional shortening. And you can see here that the left ventricle uh, lumen is actually contracting by greater than uh, 25 to 40 percent. Now taking a look at a heart with decreased ejection fraction, we can see some notable differences. 
the mitral valve leaflet motion is much less pronounced. The anterior leaflet is not reaching as close to the interventricular septum, and this is causing an increase in the E-point septal separation. You can see that the cavity of the left ventricle is not contracting nearly as much, and so that leads to less fractional shortening. And you can also appreciate that the myocardium is not thickening to the same degree as we saw in the former images. Remember that in order to get an accurate visual evaluation, we do have to obtain two more views and inspect the same criteria that we looked at with the parasternal long axis view. The mitral valve leaflet motion will be a little more difficult to inspect, and so will be more so dependent on myocardial thickening and fractional shortening. By tracing the margins of the left ventricular cavity on the machine during end diastole and then again during end systole, the machine can detect any changes in the cavity size, otherwise known as fractional shortening, and it can then calculate an estimated ejection fraction. And this is what is known as the Simpson method. In order to employ the Simpson method, we have to obtain an apical four-chamber view of the heart. And this is done by using a phased array probe placed on the anterior axillary line of the chest at the apex of the heart. We align the probe along the short axis of the heart, which runs between the right hip and the left shoulder, placing the indicator of the probe on the same side as the screen marker, and then aim the beam towards the right shoulder. Some tips to obtaining a good apical four-chamber view are to have the patient lie in the left lateral position at least 30 to 40 degrees, and once we obtain the view, we want to rotate the probe to widen the ventricle as much as possible while it's in view. We then obtain the view shown here which displays the right atrium, the left atrium, the right ventricle, and the left ventricle. Once we've obtained a satisfactory apical four-chamber view, we press the freeze button, and we then use the touchpad to scroll to the end of diastole, which represents maximum ventricular filling. At this point, we press the calc button on the machine, and we select left ventricular volume, and under this menu, we select apical four-chamber diastole. We then use a touchpad to trace the interior margins of the left ventricle. And if you have to go back and undo some of the dots, just go ahead and press undo as many times as you need and continue tracing. The key here is to trace from annulus of the mitral valve around the ventricle back to annulus. Once we're done, we press the select button and we select the save option. At this point, we can press the calc button to return to our frozen images and then use the touchpad to continue scrolling through the images until we find one that represents end systole. And this is where the left ventricular volume is at its minimum size. We again select calc and repeat the process, this time selecting the apical four-chamber systole option to take our measurements of the ventricle. Again, we trace the ventricle annulus to annulus and we press the select button and select the save option and this will then bring up a figure of calculated ejection fraction on the screen. Now it is worthwhile to note that accuracy of the Simpson method has been shown to improve by adding measurements in the apical two chamber views as well uh, but this is something that can be incorporated later on once the operator learns how to obtain the apical two chamber views which were not discussed in this presentation. In the final method we'll be discussing, we calculate an ejection fraction by employing M mode to take measurements of the heart and detect fractional shortening. To use this method, we place the machine in cardiac mode and obtain a parasternal long axis view as previously discussed. We place the M mode line at the tip of the mitral valve leaflets and activate the M mode graph. Now remember that the M mode graph is a graph of all the points along the M mode line plotted versus time. The two-dimensional image which is providing the point plots remains in the top right of the screen for reference. So as you can see, what we're seeing in the graph is the portion of the right ventricular wall, the right ventricular lumen, the interventricular septum, the left ventricular lumen, and the left ventricular posterior wall. And by measuring these segments with the calipers, the machine will generate a calculated EF for us. In order to enter the measurements, we select calc and then select 
LV for left ventricle, and we're presented with the following display. At this point, we can hit select and begin utilizing the calipers to measure each of these segments individually. Here's an example of an ideal image in order to take proper measurements. In order to get an image of this quality, we have to make sure that the M mode line is placed just beyond the mitral valve leaflets and that we do capture a portion of the right ventricle in the view as well. What you can appreciate here is that the diastolic measurements have already been entered and all that's left is to find an area of systole, such as, for example, here, and to go ahead and obtain those measurements at this time. And that will then generate an estimated EF. And with that, we have now discussed three methods of obtaining ejection fraction during point of care echocardiography. And these are visual assessment methods, the Simpson method, and the M mode method. And with time, these can become uh, more familiar. Accuracy will build over time, and it's something that you can add to your repertoire.